Yeah, hello my people, my beautiful and awesome viewers. Yeah, welcome to my platform, Timo Starboy, Reality Talk TV. Yeah, good evening right here. Yeah, so I greet you at your location time. So, Yawa don't gas, oh, Yawa don't gas. Yawa don't gas for APC. And, uh, you know, say na Egbe Kegbe, APC, Alien People's Corruption. Alien people corruption. Then they do their corruption. Then they play their game. You know, it's, it, they are full of game. All these uh, cartoon games, all these uh, petty petty games where you know make sense. You know, I don't know where their games is going to lead them to. You know, so we need to ask them a, a, a serious question. So where are they going? They have stole somebody Monday. Is there to return their the some the load they stole? You know. To put the shame uh, off. Yeah? To put the shame off. And they are still struggling with somebody's load. You rob somebody, right? And you, uh, instead of you to return their, their property, you are still putting sense. You are putting your effort, you know, that you, you, re, you reclaim the, uh, the, 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 the property that is not, it's not belong to you. So how, how, come, how, how does that happen? Where does it happen? You know, in this uh, century, we have caught you red handed. So you have to drop what is in your hand. So now it's like um, the petition, if you guys can remember that uh, OB, that is uh, LP, wrote to the uh, tribunal. So they say they gave them the time to reply the petition. Now they, they are instead of them to reply the petition in a in a good manner, they are even contra contradicting the petition. You know, they want to be subduing the uh, maybe the, catapulting the petition instead of them to give them the reason, the correct reason. You know, so they too they are writing a petition that OB is not qualified and uh, he jumped from one party to. <laughs> Hey, the soup we don't it, it, it don't water, oh. eh? They don't water the the soup. The soup it don't become a uh, omishoro, you know. The thing don't water, water don't pass Gary. So that is how they just throw the whole thing. They just throw their uh, this uh, nonsense uh, petition. They throw it away. Say you are just talking nonsense. You are talking rubbish. You don't know how to guide yourself, you know. You don't have any case. They just throw their petition away. They say this is nonsense. You know? Whereby everybody has his own knowledge. You know? We are not a fool. Our judiciary, they are doing best. So this is what we want from them. Let them continue to be throwing all this uh, garbage. All this garbage story. They think everybody is a fool. They can buy everybody. Not this, uh, not this time. Not this time. It's, it's not going to be business as usual. You know? So let me not uh, talk too much. Let me just play you the video and, uh, you know, as usual. So we, we go on. Petition from Peter will be as a very big is a record, you know. So let, let's play it. 29, mm. let's be very factual. Even the senior advocate of Nigeria knows that himself. Sambo. His name must Mr. Sambo. Sambo. Yeah. Uh, uh, I put it in the speaker. The legal process could be hastened. But of course, you know that if the legal process is hastened and... Proceedings are not, uh, you know, upheld, then that will open up another front for another legal battle. So it's good for you to actually go through the entire process yeah. and not rush. Okay. I mean, uh, if we had followed what the Justice uh, uh, Uwe's uh, report, uh, committee report has said in 2011, we wouldn't be where we are now because, I mean, by the recommendations of that panel, we would have been able to conclude everything before the president. Uh, elect is actually sworn in. Uh, but we have seen that that's not the case. In the First and Second Republic, you could see things like that happening, but it's unfortunate that in this Fourth Republic, we're not seeing things like that have been, uh, you know, happening. But uh, the good thing that I really love about what is happening here is that INEC is being put on trial itself, uh, and that's why I think um, the petition by the Labour Party deserves some uh, commendation. Yeah. Because they simply transferred the onus 
uh, on INEC to prove to Nigerians that it conducted this election uh, in accordance with its uh, 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 guiding uh, uh, law, which is the Electoral Act 2022, yes, and then yes, of yes, course yes. its uh, guidelines. And so it's left for INEC to prove to Nigerians, uh, including to their uh, 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 server, and then of course you have uh, the portal which they are put in place, IREF, uh, for the you know viewing of results to prove to us that they follow their own guidelines. And if they do that, you see that the Amazon Web Service that actually hosts the cloud services of INEC is being put into you know a public glare right now. INEC will have to tell us uh, uh, through uh, the Amazon Web Service if they are subpoenaed uh, as to how exactly these results were uploaded, why we had delays. And INEC is saying that it's going to be bringing two uh, witnesses uh, from its uh, IT department to talk to us as to why there were results uh, delay here and there. Well, all of this will provide clarity, and if they do not know how to provide answers to these questions, and of course, you know, technology, there are trails, and of course, some of these petitioners will follow through the trails, and then, of course, it will be difficult for INEC to be able to uphold this integrity. But I can tell you that that petition by the Labour Party deserves a lot of uh, commendation, and then, of course, that of Atiku Abubakar, too, that said that some of the results ought to have been declared inconclusive in certain parts of the country. But I next seemed too hasty and went ahead to do those declarations. So it's left for us to be able to see the full content of what I think we meant by those things, by saying that some of those results that came in actually were declared hastily. And then the last part of it, uh, before I let uh, my other colleague come, come, come in, is that um, I let national chairman, uh, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, told us at the collision center that all the observations raised by uh, the... Uh, Hop in and participate now. Sorry. Mm. Sorry, guys. We have one of these. Uh... Hop in and participate. the party agents there were going to be attended to at the end of the collation before the final declaration was made. So at what point in time did the INEC national chairman decide to go straight ahead and make the declaration without considering the complaints by the petitioners, by uh, their party agents? I was there at the collation center and I mean I went live and I said it clearly that the INEC national chairman had promised Nigerians that he was going to review some of the observations only for the INEC national chairman to come back and announce the results. Mm. So these are some of the things that have led a, a lot of Nigerians puzzle. And Nigerians are right to request from INEC whether it follows its own procedures and the Electoral Act or not. It's left for the courts. And these judges, they are part of the Nigerian society to tell us if indeed INEC obeyed the Electoral Act, the Constitution, and of course its own guidelines or not. So somehow you, you made reference to the fact that before it, it you know, came to this. There was a time when it didn't have to take that long to address these issues, uh, you know, election petition issues in the court. What exactly was the thinking of those who decided to change it uh, to 180 days? What were the factors that may have led to that? Well, the factors are that, you know, as, as our democracy is growing, lots of Nigerians are uh, and impatient with each other. And then if you, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, from 1999 to date, you see that every election comes with its own challenges. And a lot of politicians want to take advantage of the system. Political parties that do not prepare properly for elections want to use the courts to gain power. And that's the problem that we're having. And I must come very hard on uh, the Labour Party and the PDP and the, 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 the NMP people do not, it's not challenging the presidential election as we can see. But if the Labour Party and the PDP, for example, have formed an alliance, a working alliance, like they are trying to make us see uh, after the outcome of the election, uh, would we have been in this sort of situation whereby they are heightening right. tension across the land? I mean, look at the 6.7 uh, uh, million votes that Tiku got and the, the 6.1 million that Peter will be got. How many millions do we have? That's about 13 million votes. And then you, if you add one million by uh, Kwanquanso, that's, that, that's about 14 million. Would we have been here with an APC, which is now seeing itself as a bare month because of the lack of, you know, uh, these political parties coming together? So what the political parties 
uh, in the opposition fail to do before election is what they are trying to do after the election by using the courts. Mm. And you and I know that the, there will always be a problem. And the, yeah. the, we've always stated it clearly here. Whether the days are more than 180 or less than 180, we should not allow our courts to play the role as to being the uh, the institution that determines who becomes a president or governor. The people must not be pushed away from deciding who is the winner of an election through the ballot. Our politicians want cheap win by going to the court. And that's why you hear some of them say that they should be declared president. Hmm. Why not insist that there should be a rerun? You see some of them asking to be declared president and at the same time asking that there should be a fresh election that will be held. So in all of this, the, it has to do with our political culture. A lot of people do not prepare properly before elections. Uh, you can see the, the post-election crisis that we are having in the management of political parties, how it's affecting everyone. Now, the political parties are going through the court system to see how they will circumvent it through technicalities and all of that to get a victory. But the people must be the ultimate deciders. And that's why I stated earlier that even the judges that are going to be sitting on this election petition tribunal, they are part of the Nigerian society. Yes. And as former President Bill of Jonathan Harbour, the final decider of an election must be the people through the ballot, not the courts. So the judges should not allow these politicians and political parties, presidential candidates or governorship candidates, to go through the court and get victory Instead, they should allow the people to be the ultimate decider. And as such, when we are going to go into another constitution review exercise in the 10th National Assembly, we should be very careful to look at the time frame that, by which we give. Because even if you give 365 days, I can tell you that the politicians will still not uh, you know, find it as enough time. Hmm. Our democracy is growing, but the democratic culture must change. People must learn to form alliances so that they do not overheat the polity. All right, so uh, it, uh, in the face of uh, a growing democracy, talking of the people, let's bring it back to, uh, to the people. And uh, at this point in time, I'd like to bring in Frank Tete, uh, who is also thinking that uh, it's going to be a tall order. Okay. Let go of the baggage. So that is it. Let me play you another one. Another one that um, just uh, transparent. So the issue that is on the ground, you know. So I neck um, settle defeat. This one is a. Uh, mm, this is no. The number petition responded to the five petitioners in terms of setting the date for its hearing. When we talk about the uh, about pace and the time taken to hear out, bearing in mind, as we said earlier on, that we have about 50 more days to May 29. Hold on. brings up the question, what the reason for the delay is? And that's just my big question this morning, is that why hasn't the petitions court responded with a date to the petitioners as to when to begin hearing? What is the reason for the delay? Are there things that we're waiting for? Are there procedures that ought to have begun? Why is there a delay bearing in mind the importance of the cases and the time limit that we have? Because as we, as was said by Aina, go to court, go to court, they go to court now. Now the responsibility and they are of the court to take action and respond to the petitioners. We look forward to seeing that we're all hearing the response in the next few days and of course the case um, or the, the um, trial or tribunal uh, taking on and going on as it ought to. It's a combination of both electronic and manual mm -hmm. and that's why I can come forward and say where there were breaches in terms of uh, reporting uh, on the uh, on the portal, the IRED portal, but uh, it was immaterial because it, it, from ECAT, AP is the main document. As I've been pointed out in the uh, uh, Adelaide case in Oshu by the uh, Court of Appeal. So, but where is the problem? Number one, ahead of the election, I had probably seven and a half. And, uh, you know, we had persons on this program 
So you do guys and I run the game changer. Mm. And uh, this is the major thing that has happened to Nigerian uh, democratic process. Mm. The resort to technology. I'm express persons appeared on television and elsewhere boasting that mm. uh, you know there will be transmission of results real time, mm. online, technology. Making money change everything. Now this is my neck, you see here another thing. <laughs> This is this should be a lesson for this public officials. Totally nonsense. If you have a law, Babala you nonsense. Have your own and you are acting within the scope of the law. It's Babala and nonsense. You promise things you don't know. Who are you fooling? Or that you are not ready to deliver. So people are relying on annexation statements, and there is evidence mm. that has been provided to show annex officials saying this is what we will do. So which means that part of the problem with the Electoral Act 2022. If those who are even supposed to operationalize the law do not understand it. Yeah, exactly. So one of the fallouts of this electoral process will be people taking a second look at that electoral act and committing it to act. Section 149 of the same electoral act uh, 2022 says, well, if you are aggrieved, to go to court. So, and that is what has happened with five political parties going to the tribunal. However, part of the problem in our you know, electoral duplication system, is that the presumption of regularity is on the part of INEC. Yeah. The burden of proof is heavily and resting yeah. on uh, the petitioners. And there are lawyers who have argued that, no, maybe that's not uh, uh, very fair. But in any case, uh, that's what we have. That's the law as we have it at the moment. But the uh, presidential uh, you know, election petition tribunal as well as fixed a date for hearing. Mm. These are probably some of the issues that will come up along with section 131 of the 1999 constitution, along with section 134 2 of uh, you know, the uh, 1999 constitution, and other technical issues that may be raised in terms of how practically you know, that election was uh, conducted. But I will appeal. <laughs> I will appeal uh, in the midst of all of this is to say, well, people should have faith in the judicial system. People should not resort uh, to their own devices. And, uh, we should allow the judiciary to do its work. Hmm. That's the point that I make uh, more or less is on trial and will be on trial at the election petitions yes, uh, tribunal. That is what and, we want. Uh, recall that, um, Respected former president of the NBA, be, Adam, actually raised an issue about to be in court a party in the election case. petitions, uh, saying that it really be 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 in, this, in this particular case. Well, what do you make of Alex Rowan in all of it? I cannot be neutral. I will always justify the elections it has conducted and uh, the, the results that it has declared. If it had any problem with those results, it probably would have declared them. Mm. If it had uh, problems with regards to the procedures that were adopted that ran foul to the provisions of the Electoral Act, it would not declare the results. So if INEC had received all of the resources it required and requested for to conduct an election and went ahead to return uh, winners for those elections, INEC would do everything possible, expectedly, to defend the outcome of the elections. And uh, it, it's, it's usually... In spite of the many uh, litigation. Well, the, well the, the, there's an ample provision, budgetary provision by INEC, to actually tackle uh, litigation that will arise from the elections that it conducted. Our hope and expectation had always been that when would we get to that point, even for the presidential election, when INEC would actually conduct elections and there would be no much contention. Apart from William Jonathan, who decided to extend a, a, a demo, an unprecedented democratic culture of uh, calling to congregate the president actually before the results were declared, it, it means that INEC hasn't really conducted elections in such a manner that really seeks the confidence of the parties so that have uh, participated uh, to the extent of now saying that we are good and fine and a good deal. But we have now seen a culture, an established culture and norm of making litigation a part and parcel of our electoral process in a, in a situation where those who actually seemingly lack the legitimacy to operate to the, or in, in terms of exercising popular mandate will first and foremost be declared and be sworn in before the court will now give that stamp of legitimacy, that stamp of finality 
uh, be, be problematic over and uh, do proper governance. And that's not good for our democracy. Let me bring in Samna here. Samna, uh, uh, good to see you again. Thanks for your time as always. Well. Uh, you know, very quickly, one of the key concerns Nigerians have raised uh, is uh, till this moment, we haven't actually seen the legal fireworks, uh, you know, begin. And uh, it comes to some of the key concerns of uh, many Nigerians, uh, including Olisak Bakuba, who said that the, uh, the courts uh, can be very proactive uh, to the extent that uh, these, uh, these cases can be dispensed with uh, before May 29. Thank you so much, Suleiman. Um, it's, it may be difficult for these um, cases to be dispensed of before uh, May 29th. Let's be very factual. Even the senior advocate of Nigeria knows that himself, but he's only just hoping that uh, uh, indeed the legal process could be hastened. But of course, you know that if the legal process is hastened and certain procedures are not, uh, you know, upheld, then that will open up another front for another legal battle. So it's good for it to actually go through the entire process and not rush. I mean, uh, if we had followed what the Justice uh, uh, Ray's uh, report, uh, committee report has said in 2011, we wouldn't be where we are now because, I mean, by the recommendation of that panel, we would have been able to conclude everything before the president uh, elect is actually sworn in. Uh, but we have seen that that's not the case. In the First and Second Republic, you could see things like that happening, but it's unfortunate that in this Fourth Republic, we're not seeing things like that being, uh, you know, happening. But uh, the good thing that I really love about what is happening here is that INEC is being put on trial itself, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I think um, the petition by the Labour Party deserves some uh, commendation, because they simply transferred the owners uh, on INEC to prove to Nigerians that it conducted this election uh, in accordance with its uh, 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 guiding uh, uh, law, which is the Electoral Act 2022, and then, of course, its uh, guidelines. And so it's left for INEC to prove to Nigerians, uh, including through their uh, 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 server, and then, of course, you have uh, the portal which they have put in place, IREF, uh, for the, you know, view of results, to prove to us that they follow their own guidelines. Right. And if they do that, you see that the Amazon Web Service that actually hosts the cloud services of INEC is being put into, you know, a public glare right now. INEC will have to tell us uh, uh, through uh, the Amazon Web Service if they are subpoenaed uh, as to how exactly these results were uploaded, why we had delays, and INEC is saying that it's going to be bringing two uh, witnesses uh, from its uh, IT department to talk to us as to why there were results uh, delayed here and there. Well, all of this will provide clarity, and if they do not know how to provide answers to these questions, of course, you know, technology, there are trails, mm. and of course, some of these petitioners will follow through the trails, and then, of course, it will be difficult for INEC to be able to uphold this integrity. But I can tell you that that petition by the Labour Party deserves a lot of uh, commendation. And then, of course, that of Atiku Abubakar, too, that said that some of the results ought to have been declared inconclusive in certain parts of the country. Mm. But I next seemed too hasty and went ahead to do those declarations. So it's left for us to be able to see the full content of what Atiku meant by those things, by saying that some of those results that came in actually were declared hastily. And then the last part of it, uh, before I let uh, my other colleague come, come, come in, is that um, I let National Chairman, uh, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, told us at the collision center that all the observations raised by uh, the uh, uh, agents, the party agents, they were going to be attended to at the end of the collation before the final declaration was made. So at what point in time did that the INEC national chairman decide to go straight ahead and make the declaration that will without rule considering it. the complaints and by the petitioners, stand. by uh, their party agents? I was there at the collation center, mm. and I mean, I went live, and I said it clearly that the INEC national chairman had promised Nigerians that he was going to review some of the observations, yeah. only for the INEC national chairman to come back and announce and the, the results. results. So these are some of the things that are uh, a lot of Nigerians pose. That is Nigerians the nonsense are right we are talking about. To request from INEC that is the obvious nonsense we are talking and about. The I not. It's left for the courts, and these judges, they are part of the Nigerian society, to yeah. tell us if indeed INEC obeyed the Electoral Act, the Constitution, and of course his own guidelines or not. Thank you, uh, a self-inflicted wound by INEC. And I have one. 
the final decider of an election must be the people through the ballot, not the courts. So exactly. the judges should not allow these politicians and political parties, presidential candidates or governorship candidates, to go through the court and get victory. Instead, they should allow the people to be the ultimate decider. Mm. And as such, That's a good point. when we are going to go into another constitution review exercise in the Third National Assembly, we should be very careful to look at the time frame that, by which we give. Because even if you give 365 days, I can tell you that the politicians will still not uh, you yeah, know, find satisfied. it as enough time. Yeah. Our democracy is growing, but the democratic culture must change. People must learn to form alliances so that they do not overheat the polity. All right, so exactly. in the face of So that is it. Let me play you this one. And uh, this one is the last one. So we can... Okay. I think um, it's right here. Hold well on for me. Uh, Chiamanda, thank you very much indeed for joining us, and I apologize for the stress you had to go through getting to the studio. I understand it's yeah. pouring buckets in Lagos, and there's the snarling up of traffic. <laughs> so thank Indeed. you very much uh, for joining us. Well, I should, I, I should apologize. I should have left, um, you know, in Lagos, of course, I should have left on time, so I, I should apologize. Mm. But the, the, the most important thing is that you're here. So let's get straight into it, because you mm. called the 2023 presidential election a slap to the face of the Nigerian people exactly. and insults to the collective blue intelligence of the Nigerian face. Tell Not us how you slap. see it that way. I neck is the problem. Um, well, I, I, I see that when I wrote that letter, because I think it's important to preserve the truth. Right? And I think that when something like this happens in a country, it's really important to tell the story of what happened. One of my favorite poems and it has this line, it's by Robert Lowell, and it says, and yet, why not say what happened? So I wanted to say what happened. And what happened is that this was an election that was, was really unforgivably flawed, and there was evidence for that. And I felt it was important to say that. But also I wanted to, um, I wanted to call out the US for what I consider a kind of two-facedness mm. when it comes to Africa. So. Well, the U.S. has a long history of complicity in you know, sort of non-democratic um, elections. Guys, the name of the speaker is uh, Chimamada, Chimamada, Chimamada Ngozi. So he's the one who wrote a letter to Joe Biden, U.S. Uh, president. So just in case, hear from her. On this continent, so recently in Congo, uh, two or three years ago, they endorsed an election that was an absolute sham. But then the same U.S. would turn around and criticize Congo for not being democratic. Mm -hmm. And so my point was to say, be what you say you are. Like you, cannot, you cannot criticize African countries for being undemocratic, mm -hmm. while at the same time endorsing something that is quite self-evidently undemocratic. Mm. Well, that's a good point. But just uh, delving deeper into your letter, um, you were quite categorical in saying that the electoral process was imperiled not by technical shortcomings, but by deliberate manipulation. Is there enough evidence in your assessment to support that claim? Yes, I think, I think maybe the most declaring is that we Nigerians all saw these mutilated election sheets, right? We all saw them. We saw polling unit agents talking about how um, what they had from the polling unit was not what was then announced formally, officially, or uploaded formally, officially. And, and I think for me, that's a really striking um, reason and an example of how this election was, it was not about technical glitches. And can we also realize that Nigeria is full of very bright young people in tech? Um, there's no reason for that excuse a technical glitch yeah. and the yeah. other question then is if it was a technical glitch why was it why was it possible for most people to upload the results of the other federal elections but mm -hmm. not the presidential 
Um, and, and I think most of all is that there's just been this resounding, mm. um, unfortunate silence from from IMEC and from the chair of IMEC. I think Nigeria has yes, 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 yes. respect yes, yeah, thank you. Um, an oh, institution you. that's supposed to shepherd their democracy. So maybe it's come out to explain to brand. Nigerians how Promote our happened. brand, okay? There was a statement about technical glitches. It's unconvincing. Promote our and brand. knowing how much so that we'll be uploading and trust every day that Nigerians you. invested Enter, in this election, you. knowing that Nigeria is a no-trust society, means, I think, that if people really are sincere and there's really nothing to hide, then you make an extra effort to go out and explain to Nigerians mm. what happened. Yes, that, that certainly makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. But in, in reacting to your letter um, and some of the things that you, you said in it, the APC have suggested that you were not in Nigeria during the election and you did not vote and therefore should not make categorical statements about an election you did not witness. What's your reaction to that? That's a funny question. Um, well, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's very useful criticism. I should say first of all that I've never been faced by criticism, I and mean, I wrote this, of course, knowing fully well that there would be criticism from in certain quarters. Um, and it's been I've seen a few things people have sent to me, and it's kind of been amusing to read the um, to read the juvenile fulminations of non-juvenile people. Mm. But that said, um, I actually did try very hard. And I should say, I have two homes. I have, I have a home here in Lagos, I have a home in the US. Um, I'm very often here. I tried very hard to get my PVC. And the reason I tried very hard is because I had been assured that technology would save us. Mm. Right? That, that it had walked in, or she walked in a kitty, um, and I think in Anambra, that it that it would save us. And so I really tried. And we should also talk about how difficult it was to collect PVCs and how that in itself is a form of voter disenfranchisement. Mm. And so I had done the first part, but then I couldn't collect my PVC. And so yes, did not vote. But my not voting does not mean that I cannot comment on an election. I'm a Nigerian citizen. Um, I, I, every Nigerian citizen has a right to have an opinion exactly. about this election. And so when people say um, that B has worked, but I really didn't work, which is sort of a way of um, countering the accusation that technology that, te that technology was manipulated. Really, the response is both have to work for the election to be credible. Right? So Beavers was about making sure that we didn't have ghost voters, that you know, people who were actually there voted. But, but that it defeats the purpose if you then do not upload the results, because those results that you have you know, accredit we made sure that real people voted, but then these real results, we can't see them in real time. We cannot see them as um, Professor Yakubu um, Mahmoud said. He said, and I'm going to quote because I read this so many times, um, that the public will be able to view mm. the polling unit results as soon as elections are finalized on election day. Right? So I think that's and a really happen. important thing to, to talk about and to address with the Nigerian people. Um, the Electoral Act says that IMEC, you know, give IMEC the legal backing to have electronic transmission of, of um, results and did say in a format that IMEC would decide. Right? And we know that format because the chair of IMEC told us what the format would be when he said that these results would be uploaded. Um, at the end of voting from the polling units. And that was not done. And it seems to me strange to sort of deflect from that important issue and talk about how someone you know, um, is not in Nigeria and how... So, th th those are not the points. The point is, what happened? What happened? Well, absolutely. And I suppose that that is also the crux, to some extent, of the... Uh, legal challenges that are ongoing at the moment in, in court. But in, in the sort of rather caustic response to that letter that you wrote to Mr. Biden, um, you, you mentioned uh, Mahmoud Yakubu there, 
Um, the Telugu team have suggested that you may face a lawsuit over an allegation contained in your letter that Mr. Telugu may have compromised the chairman of INEC, Mahmoud Yakubu, although you also point out that there is no evidence of the astronomical US dollar amount he is rumored to have received from the president-elect. Are you worried about the possibility of a lawsuit? No, no, and um, I'm not worried about at all. Again, I think that these are things that try to deflect from what is really important and what is at stake. It would be very useful if people could point out what is untrue in the letter. Uh, so I, I think it's important, you know, we talk about, um, we all know the stories of people who complained about you know, how we voted at the polling unit is not what we're seeing reflected in the results. Um, all of these stories, which, yes, are... Uh, the anecdotes, um, but I think they give us useful insight into what happened in that election. In a way, it, it becomes a kind of all of these anecdotes together become a kind of um, a kind of tidal wave of truth telling. And I think that the rumors surrounding this election are part of the story of this election. If you leave a gap in information, people will try to fill that gap. Yes. It's how human it's how human minds work. And again, like I said, this is our country is such a low trust society, and we're so desperate to believe in something. And when we believe in this election, it doesn't work out well, and nobody nobody gives us a convincing reason. So of course, people are going to know more about um, you know people being compromised. Also, our political landscape is is you know, steeped in, in in people being compromised. So I'm not I'm not worried about that. I think that. Um, any fair-minded person in this country who's honest mm. will acknowledge that these rumors are circulating. I said very clearly there's no evidence for them, but I do think it's important to, to say in the story of this election that many people are starting to think that what explains what happened is this compromising. Yes, and, and of course, um, you supported Peter Obi, the candidate of the Labour Party in that election. Um, he, according to the official results, came third. And we've seen uh, a number of spokesmen from the APC suggesting that you were supporting your, 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 your sort of tribesmen, to use a, a rather sort of old term. But in that context, what do you make of the polarization of the, and the ethnic divisions that appear to be deepening as a result of this election? Do you see ethnicity as being politicized? If so, how dangerous is that in your assessment? Um, well, to address the first part, um, and you're right, tribes, tribesman is such an outdated and strange expression, which I think also says something about whoever is using it, right? Um, I think that, that that kind of accusation is is a practice of what um, psychologists call projecting. So you're doing something, but then you accuse someone else of doing it, even though they're not. Um, I, I did not support Peter B because he's an um, Igbo as I am. Um, well, I, I'm a person who does not um, take positions lightly. And so while I very much admire um, Peter B, respect him, there are many other Igbo men who I admire and respect, and I would never vote for them for president because I just don't think they would make me president. And so my support for Peter B is actually rooted in, in real things. It's rooted in... Um, my faith in his ability and actually i got to know him um, i got to know peter b years ago when he came to um, pay homage to my parents because he had heard that my father was the first professor of statistics in nigeria and that my mother had um, retired as the first female registrar um, of the university of nigeria and so this man just sort of arrived and said he wanted to pay homage and i was very impressed by that because it showed me how much he values education. And then he becomes governor of Anambra State and he takes Anambra State to number one in education. Um, and I remember being very impressed by the story of how he had given his personal phone number to all of the um, senior prefects in secondary schools in, in Anambra, which I think also showed me that he's interested in what ordinary people think. Right? You don't just want to hear from the administrators, you want to hear from the students about what's really happening. 
and um, his focus on insecurity, um, he really tackled kidnapping in Anambra. And I also remember that he, um, he really sort of clashed with the Anambra elite when he was tackling insecurity and, and kidnapping. And that showed me that he's quite decisive. He even has a bit of a stubborn streak. You know, he's, he's very focused on things. And so that's really why I support him. Um, so this idea of, of, of sort of ethnicity is, is just really, again, I think it's a way of deflecting. Let's focus on what really matters. It's unfortunate that, and, I, and, and can I just say that I think that it's only one part, one part of the political spectrum that is politicizing ethnicity, and I think it's very unfortunate. But I don't think most people in Nigeria really care about ethnicity as much as they care about having a country that works. You know, we want good leadership. Mm -hmm. We want the hospitals and the schools and the roads to be good. And whether and, and that affects everyone in the world, in general, it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, again, people would agree with that assessment from you. But I wonder if I might change direction slightly and get your thoughts on the Nobel laureate uh, Wale Shoyinka's assertion on a wise news about reactions to the election results by the Labour Party's vice presidential candidate, Yusuf Dati Baba Ahmed, comments which Professor Shoyinka described as fascistic. I mean, do you see that as part of the demonization of Mr. B and his running mate, as some have suggested, or do you agree that Dati Baba Ahmed went, or rather overstepped the bounds, and Professor Suika was in that regard justified to call him to order. I mean, I know you hold, or at least you have held, Mr. Suika in high esteem. I still do. Um, I, I have a lot of love for Professor Suika. Um, I admire him, I respect him as a thinker, as a writer. Um, I think everyone should read The Man Died. And Ake, his memoir is beautiful, right? Um, but at the same time, I, I disagree very strongly with him about this particular issue. And actually, because I respect Professor Shoenka so much, I went back and watched the interview. I had watched it when it aired initially, but I went back and watched it because I thought, am I missing something? And I, I think fascist is a really strong word. The fascist actually often makes me think of Mussolini's Italy. But I think we use it now, you know, sort of to... Uh, address this kind of authoritarianism that's often populist and right-wing, you know, like in Hungary, and, and even the, the former American president. And when you look at those situations, you can see why they have been termed fascist. Um, and I, I did not see any reason that um, Mr. Dati Baba Ahmed's interview would have been termed fascist. You know, I think he was making a very strongly um, felt point about the elections. Um, what he was saying, which again I thought seemed fairly reasonable, is um, that uh, if, the, if our democracy is rooted in our constitution, and we then swear in a person who's been elected unconstitutionally, then you are in fact ending democracy. It's, yeah. I think it's quite a reasonable um, position. Of course we can argue about what that bit in the constitution means, right? And I'm actually grateful for this whole election period because it's made me read things I probably never would have, such as the Nigerian constitution, mm. and also made me have quite a few suggestions for editing. But anyway, um, I think now we're talking about what does and mean, mm. right? So, so Mr. Dati Baba Ahmed is saying that it's you know, two-thirds and the FCT, and that that's separate. And it's a reasonable argument. You know, and is a conjunction. We, we use it in that context often to mean plural. Right? So we say um, Aisha and Yemi are coming. And we don't say Aisha and Yemi is coming. That's because they're two separate things, two separate entities. And of course the, the court will interpret. But I don't think I don't think it's unreasonable for educated Nigerians who can read, who know what the word and means to make their own interpretations and to argue it. And of course, the fact that the Labour Party is in court means that they do not believe that this election is, cost is constitutional. And so I, I just didn't, um, I, I didn't quite see why it would be um, termed fascist. I mean, we could, 
I think um, a charitable way of reading Professor Schoenka's comment is that Professor Schoenka himself, um, I think it's fair to say that he is not given to restraint in language mm. um, in general. And so maybe that's where that word fascist came from. Uh, however, I have suggestions for what we could use fascist for. We could use fascist for a neck because as it is right now, many Nigerians feel deeply cheated by a neck, um, deeply disenfranchised by a neck. And there's an authoritarianism, which obviously is the basis of fascism, at the center of manipulating an election. Um, because what you're doing is you're gagging people, you're forcibly taking away their voice. Mm -hmm. That is fascist. Yeah. Fascist is all of the violence that happened during the elections. Um, fascist is the way that some people remain silent about, about that violence. Um, fascist is, uh, you know, fascist is a, is a government that hasn't come out to address the, the very tangible and palpable discontent in this country. Well, I think that, um, that, and when I say that fa we can use fascist for Alec, what I mean is the fact that you know, so many of us, including myself, are convinced that this was not in any way technological um, glitch. I think that Professor um, Yakubu had an opportunity for heroism, mm -hmm. and I think he wasted it spectacularly. Um, because he could very easily have become the hero of not just Nigerians but Africa, because so many Africans are watching and they were so inspired by what happened before this election, the, the obedient movement. And, and so you know, I also think that the president, um, President Buhari, missed an opportunity for heroism, maybe his last chance at heroism, because Nigerians do not feel that he, I think Nigerians felt before the elections that he meant well and meant um, to time. support credible elections. I don't think many Nigerians think that now. Right. And I wish that he had taken a, a page from, um, you know, from a very good man. Because we're out of time. That was a really good man, a moral man. Right. All right, all right, guys. That was a uh, that was a uh, the word from uh, Chimamadu Chimamada Ngozi Adichie. So, anyway, we will end up the program right now. So, thank you for you that uh, you people you view our program and uh we love you we love you we love you so we view it back and uh, understand what is going on at your doorstep you know at behind your your corridor so this is all about uh apc uh, pdp and the uh, labor party their game started you know so we don't know when it's going to end because this yeah, for me, if you if you take my opinion, I will tell you categorically that this thing is gonna be very rough, you know, because there is a lot of uh, glitches, there's a lot of uh, uh, fascist language and all those kind of things, you know, they are talking about. So for me, I just want to be putting it in your own view to understand your. Uh, what is surrounding you? What is you are lacking to to educate from? So that's how our program is uh, all about. You know, we just put the program to enlighten ourselves, to share more light to our uh, our view. You know, so that we can input uh, what is need. You know, in our daily basis. So thank you, viewers. I love you all. Next time I will bring more interesting and more. Um, you know how the the case is moving on so we'll not let you lack so that is our work here so thank you viewers once again i love you all have a wonderful time and wonderful day bye to me from me timo starboy uh is a presenter so please join me on my youtube youtube channel timo starboy reality talk tv on my facebook page Timo Starboy Channel Blog on my Twitter, Timo Oladi Wupo One. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Bye. Mwah. Mwah.